Robert Neild for joining the Hong Kong Heritage Project for our Hong Kong History Lecture Series. Thank you for having me, I'm delighted. What first attracted European sailors to Hong Kong? Well, uh, very different to what attracts them now. It's because uh, Wan Chai and the girly bars weren't there then, but um, the Europeans started coming to this part of the world uh, in the 15th century. And uh, in the 15th century, there was a huge explosion of exploration out of Europe, uh, particularly Portugal and Spain. And they went across the Atlantic, of course, to, to uh, open up North and South America. But there had always been um, stories and fables and rumors of the East and all the treasures of the East and the spices and wonderful silks that came from the East. Uh, even going back as far as Roman times, there's, there's records of um, contact between the Roman Empire and the Chinese Empire all the way back then, 2,000 years ago. But the Portuguese came out here first, um, followed by the Dutch and then the British, uh, with their sort of colonial expansions, each one taking the place of the other. Um, and why they came to Hong Kong is all related to the bad experience that they were having in, in Canton, as Canton was... Uh, for 300 years or so, the only officially open city in China where foreigners could go. Um, a very easy question is going to give a very long answer because it involves the, uh, particularly the Opium War, so-called the First Anglo-Chinese War, uh, which Britain fought because um, they were frustrated at the restrictions in Canton. Britain in the 1830s was very much into free trade uh, even though that trade was in a noxious drug called opium, um, that was of secondary importance, strangely. Today we couldn't really countenance that sort of thing, but in those days free trade was the main thing. Is opium? Well, that doesn't matter. It's trade we're talking about. And um, there was no freedom in Canton. The Europeans were, f were, were uh, very heavily restricted on what they could do, where they could go, where they could live, who they could sell to, and they thought this just isn't on. And it produced a conflict, and result, to, to cut a very long story short, the uh, result of that conflict was that the British community found itself sheltering in Hong Kong's harbour. They'd been kicked out of Canton. Uh, the Portuguese in Macau, they'd been there since the 1500s. Uh, the Portuguese in Macau were either too weak, or maybe you could say too pragmatic to allow the British to set up shop in Macau. So. The British community was, was on a fleet of ships with nowhere to go, and it ended up just out here, in fact, in the harbour that's, that's behind you. Um, it was sheltered, it was conveniently close to the main action at that time, which was Macau stroke Canton. Uh, it was a sheltered harbour, um, largely undiscovered, the harbour, although the south coast of Hong Kong Island had been seen by passing British ships before. They chose this place just to sit and rest for a while to see what happened. Um, that's what brought them here initially. What events led to Captain Elliot taking possession of Hong Kong Island in 1841? Captain Elliot was, um, I, I, I think he was a very able, uh, honest, straightforward man. He was much criticised at the time. He was thrust into the position that he had. Um, he started out as number four in a team under Lord Napier, who, was, who came out uh, to, to Canton as the head of the British trade setup, if you like, superintendent of British trade. Napier had a very unfortunate time, so the number two went to number one, and they all popped up the ladder one until poor old Elliot found himself popping out at the top of the pile. Uh, he never intended to be, uh, but I think he took on the job extremely well. And he had the misfortune, if you like, to be in charge at the time that the conflict erupted, the First Anglo-Chinese War, or the so-called Opium War, erupted. Um, he did his best at the time. He was the one who led the British community out of Canton, tried to get in Macau, couldn't. He was the one who led the fleet to here, to this harbour um, in front of us. and. Um, he said, right, well, we're going to land here. We need somewhere. We've been kicked out of one place. We're not allowed into the other place, being Macau. We need somewhere to, to, to have as our commercial base. Let it be here. So he landed on the 25th of January, 1841, just down the, down the road. Um, it's still marked as Possession Street. 
um, Possession Street, it's, it's very non-politically correct these days, but Possession Street. He landed on the 25th of January 1841, and the following day there was a flag-raising ceremony, uh, and the British had arrived. What do we know um, that Hong Kong was like in 1841, in terms of the population and, and the territory and the geography of the place? I think uh, quite a lot is known, and there's a number of scholars who've written um, in, in uh, some detail uh, about that period. Um, the population of Hong Kong Island, because in those days Hong Kong was just the island, uh, we'll come to the, the other bits, Kowloon and the New Territories in a moment, but Hong Kong was just the island. The population of Hong Kong was about the same as the population of that building next door. Now, about 7,000 people, I don't know if 7,000 people worked there, I wouldn't be surprised. But there are reputed to be about 7,000 people living in Hong Kong Island in those days, in the early 1840s. Uh, they were living in villages. There were one or two villages along the north coast. Stanley was uh, a large village on the south. Um, they were mainly involved in uh, the honest pursuits of fishing and piracy. But Hong Kong in those days was very remote. Um, as I said earlier, the, the harbour hadn't really been investigated. I've got maps of the early 19th century which show the coastline on the right and the coastline on the left. And in the middle, there's nothing. Cartographers in those days didn't say, well, let's assume there's a coast. If they didn't know what was there, they didn't write anything, they didn't draw anything. So we got a recognizable outline of the south of Hong Kong Island and the east and west ends. But in the middle, the line stops because they didn't know if there was a harbor or if it was blocked or there was a way through or whatever. So not much was known about the harbor. The south coast. Um, there's a waterfall at Wafu, uh, which is still there, and that waterfall was very visible from passing ships. Um, Lord, An uh, Lord Amherst stopped there in 1816 on his way up to further north. So the south coast was known a little bit, the waterfall, fresh water, so people went to, to fill up their water barrels there, but this part wasn't known. Population of 7,000-ish um, uh, in a few villages, uh, it was remote, it, it was basically nothing part of the empire in those days. Who was Hong Kong's first governor and how did he help to develop Hong Kong? Arguably the first governor was, was Captain Elliot himself uh, because he's the one who claimed it on behalf of Her Majesty, raised the flag and he was uh, the, the chief of British interests at the time but he was never actually called governor because it was a while before London accepted that, yeah, okay, we do have a colony and therefore it must have a governor, but it's not going to be him, because he was the, the baddie who put us in this mess in the first place. Um, the first governor so-called was Sir Henry Pottinger. Uh, he came from India, as so many of the um, merchants of that time did. The British had been trading in India uh, longer than they'd been trading in China. So Pottinger came from India. He was, he'd been with the East India Company. I think he was in India for 27 years. And he was um, a broad-speaking Irishman, and he was uh, known to be a man of action, uh, as well as a linguist. Uh, he had mastered a number of languages, so he's seen to be good in foreign parts. He'd been 27 years in India. Let's send him to China, because that's pretty much like India, isn't it? Uh, so he came. I can imagine him saying, right, let's get all this sorted out now. What's, what's going on here? And he came and really put the wind up people and said, right, if we're going to have this place, we're going to do it properly. And he uh, introduced um, all the sort of panoply of a, of a colonial setup, the administration. Uh, he uh, started organizing properly the, the, the land and the development rather than just being a free-for-all cowboy town, which it might have come. He's the, the tough guy, if you like, who came here for... I think only about three years, to say, right, let's get all this started out. Um, one of the, the first things he did is move his headquarters, because the, the headquarters of the Superintendency of British Trade, as it was known then, uh, was in Macau. Uh, and even after 1841, headquarters was still in uh, Portuguese Macau. Pottinger said, well, if it's going to be Hong Kong, it's going to be Hong Kong. So he moved his headquarters here, which was a major uh, vote of confidence, if you like. And, of course, well, if he's there, the merchants thought, well, maybe we should have ourselves properly there instead of really headquartered in Canton with a, a branch in, in Hong Kong. Uh, so during Pottinger's time, there was that flip from Con Canton being the main place to Hong Kong being a place of its own instead of the branch of somewhere else. Who were Hong Kong's early settlers and the commercial interests in particular? 
I think everybody knows uh, some of the, the big names, Jardy Matheson, yeah, they were here. Uh, Dents were here. If you've read your, your, your James Clavell, you'll know about the, the uh, <laughs> problems those two had with each other. They were huge rivals, hated the, each other's guts. Uh, Jardines and Dents were amongst the big companies. Uh, Sassoon's was another big um, organization later. But there were a lot of small traders who, whose names have been substantially forgotten now. If you look at the records, I mentioned the, um, the, the land sale that took place in 1841, the land auction. If you look at the records of who bought the lots, uh, and those records still exist, you can say, oh yeah, there's Jardines and there's Dents, and who on earth is that? And there's names uh, like, like Gribble, Lindsay, Turner, which mean nothing at all. But there they were standing cheek by jowl with the big boys in those days. Okay, Jardines lasted longer than all of them. Dents failed through... Um, through commercial reasons some, some years later. Um, but there were a lot of uh, small companies as well as the, the big names. But nearly all of them had come from Canton, where they, they'd been in business already, under this regime that they weren't happy with. It wasn't liberal, it wasn't clear. Uh, the rules were not laid out at all. So they came here as well. Um, opium was a big part of the business. Um, it's, it's shameful in a way that, that uh, opium is at the root, in many respects, of, of Hong Kong's founding. Um, but it wasn't the only business by, by any means. Um, in Canton, these firms were engaged in, in the big three, like, like tea and, and, and porcelain and silk. Those were the three big commodities that were being traded out of China. Uh, so companies came here they bought and just moved their offices from Canton, so they're doing the same sort of business. But very soon land speculation and building became a big issue, and it still is, of course. Hong Kong could not exist, I don't think, unless the government could sell little plots of land every now and again and make huge amounts of money. Uh, and so land speculation, property development, soon became a very big issue as well. Why did Hong Kong become a centre for early Chinese political activity? I think the, the reason it became a center for Chinese political activity is, is there was nowhere else really for people to go to, 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 to plot overthrowing the, 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 the Qing regime. They couldn't really do it in China uh, because people would tell tales and so on. They came to Hong Kong because Hong Kong was, um, as, as I keep saying, it was, a, it was a free place, it was an open place. These were the rules. There wasn't a rule that says you can't talk about overthrowing the empire. Um, there was freedom of speech, uh, as there is now. And, and uh, people came here, I think, because there wasn't really anywhere else they could go. Um, Sun Yat-sen went to a number of places. He went to America. I think he went to the Philippines for a while as well. But this is conveniently close to China, yet separate. And But even, even Dr. Sun had to keep a low profile latterly, because... The British were not uh, so wrapped up with their sense of fair play that it dominated everything. If they thought that this chap was really in danger of overthrowing the Qing government, forget for a moment whether or not that overthrow would be a good thing. We, the British government, don't really want to be seen to be part of a plot to overthrow basically a friendly government. So there came a point when, uh, look here, you know, we really ought to quieten down and watch it a bit. So. Sun Yat-sen uh, had to have his meetings here in secret uh, after a while. But I, I think it's because the place was free, open, freedom of speech. Is there any 19th century architecture that remains today in Hong Kong? There's a lot. It's all in here. <laughs> I'm going to have to cheat now and have a look at page 100 and, uh, 197. Um, there is a lot. Um, the oldest building... Uh, in Hong Kong uh, from the British period, uh, there are older Chinese ones from the British period, it's Murray Building, but that strangely is not where it used to be. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's now uh, in Stanley. Um, it's where the Bank of China used to be. Uh, there was, I remember the Murray Building standing there. It was built in 1843 as a big solid colonial statement. Uh, and it was dismantled and all the bits were numbered and stored for 10, 15, 20 years, I think, before they all came out of storage and were reassembled in Stanley. 
I would have loved that job because I used to love jigsaw puzzles and just imagine being left, I've got a brick left, where did this go? <laughs> Damn it. But that was built, that was built in, in Stanley. Um, the, the cathedral uh, is another old one from 1847 it was started, 1849 it was uh, put into use. Next to the cathedral is Flagstaff House from 1846. That was the headquarters, or the, sorry, the, the, the residence of the commander of British forces. So a nice position where you could look that way over the army and that way over the navy. And he had a nice uh, big house, which is now the Tea Ware Museum. Um, the Bishop's House, uh, just along from the cathedral of 1851. There is surprisingly a lot. I've got a list here of 10, 12 or, or, or more from the 1800s, and that's not a complete list. People who say, well, there's nothing in Hong Kong, I don't think they, they, they look. There are things in Hong Kong, okay, there's nothing like there used to be in the 1800s, but how could that be? There is a lot. There's even more from the 1900s, the early part of the, the, the pre-war period. There's a lot of uh, buildings from that era around. I think we're very lucky here. Um, because it's uh, still a, a free market, there's always going to be a problem between preservation and, and commerce. Uh, people can say, it's terrible, you should keep that building. Fine, okay, are you going to pay for it? Oh, I'm not going to pay for it. Money comes down to it at the end of the day, I'm afraid. I think we are incredibly l lucky, given that background, to have so many 19th century buildings still here. And I'm very proud of them. Thank you very much, Mr. Robert Neald. Thank you. Thank you.